El Extraordinario. Extraordinario. When did you call? Uh, it must have been about two or three weeks ago, I think. Do you mind if I record our conversation? Uh, go ahead, no problem. It's for your podcast, right? Yeah, exactly. The podcast. Thanks. This way, follow me. The person I'm walking up these stairs with is Emily. I mean, she manages the cultural Geneva. center I've come to visit in Geneva. The building is in a residential area near Lake Geneva, not far from Villa Diodati, the mansion where Mary Shelley spent a summer writing Frankenstein. But that happened 100 years before Ursula Bloom was committed to the psychiatric hospital. When was the hospital converted into a cultural center? Well, the hospital closed in 1928 and the building was left unused until 1960 when the council took over the property and called a vote to decide its future. That's how it became a cultural center. Uh, there's an, an auditorium, several temporary exhibitions uh, and a couple of permanent shows like, uh, well, like this one. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, I think this is the right key. The room is quite dark when we walk in, and while Emily opens the curtains, I can make out a cabinet in the middle of the room and two others on either side, with several panels hanging over them. When the light finally fills the room, I am stunned to find a huge photograph of Ursula Bloom on the wall behind me. It's weird. I feel as if Ursula has been watching me before I'd even noticed her. Um, can you tell me about this room? Yes, of course. It's an exhibition dedicated to Ursula Bloom, a Swiss painter who was born in 1877 in St. Gallen, just south of Lake Constance. The people that set up the current space discovered that Ursula had spent her last years here, so they decided to pay tribute to her in this room. Hmm. That's interesting. What do you mean? Well, it's not exactly the ideal place for an exhibition of this kind. I mean, when Ursula was here, it was a psychiatric hospital, and I'm not completely sure she would have picked this place had she been given the choice. Oh, I get it. I'm sure she wouldn't have, but Ursula didn't have any children, and the house where she grew up is no longer owned by her family. This room is where she lived during her final years. In this very room? Yes. Her bed was over there, by that wall. After picturing her bed against the wall, I accidentally look over to the window. It's a split second, but just enough for Emily to notice. Oh, one, one. We, um, uh, oh, we don't like to think about Ursula's life's ended. We prefer to focus on the positive part of her time. Come and look at this. Can you explain what's in the cabinets? Of course. This one holds some of the objects that she had in her room. That one has some press clippings and writings from Ursula's time. And, and this one, these are uh, sketches, notes, and some of her drawings. We even have some of her paintbrushes. She painted her last works in this corner over there. She painted them right here? That's right. When she was admitted to the psychiatric hospital, she initially stayed in a smaller room on the first floor. But then she was moved into this bigger room that looks out onto the lake. She really missed painting, and the doctors thought it would be good for her to work on her art. Yeah, that makes sense. On both sides of the room, there are reproductions of Ursula's paintings. I've seen some of them in Clara's books and photocopies. Four of them I've never seen before, and they're not hanging with the others. One looks unfinished. And what are these paintings? Ursula painted those ones here, uh, and she didn't finish this one. We had the originals here for many years, but they're on show in several museums now. Oh, do you know which ones? Yes, well, uh, I mean, I'd have to check. Uh, I know there's one in Zurich, uh, but I can't remember where the others are right now. They're all in Switzerland, that's for sure. There's an old notebook in one of the cabinets. I know exactly what it is the minute I see it. It's open on the same page that Clara had photographed and hung up on the wall in the apartment. I look around the room and see something that catches my eye. Um... How come there's no music? Music? Yeah. Um, there are lots of Ursula's belongings, but you don't have any information about her music. Oh, right. Yes, yes. Some sheet music has been attributed to Ursula Bloom, but we haven't been able to find proof that she composed those pieces. Everything that is in this room has been verified to make sure it belonged to Ursula. But I've got... Wait, hang on. Um, let's see... Look, this is a copy of the score. Ursula composed it. Let me see. Are you sure Ursula Bloom composed this? 
Yeah. I mean, I think so. <laughs> if you look at these notations and the writing in the notebook in the cabinet, it's the same handwriting. Mm -hmm. Yes, the writing does look similar, but I wouldn't go as far as saying it's the same. Where did you get this? It's, uh, it belonged to a woman who was researching Ursula Bloom. She was an art history student called Clara Torres. Do you remember her coming here? Was she Spanish? Yeah. Do you know when she visited us? It must have been about five years ago, I guess. Oh, well, I haven't been working here that long, but if she was researching Ursula Bloom, this room was probably on her list. I can't think of any other place with this much information on Ursula, especially not this much verified information. How did Clara know Ursula composed this music? I think, well, the truth is I've never actually spoken to her. But among her notes I found the number from a musician called Milo Ziegenthaler? Ziegenthaler. Do you know him? No, but that surname is very common in the German part of Switzerland. Ah. Well, it looks like he's also a historian and a collector, and he has some of Ursula's music. He's the one who sent Clara the score. I'm meeting him tomorrow. That's cool. Let's see what you can find out from him. Okay, so do you need anything else? Or? Yes. Um, well, you see, I'm trying to fill in a few gaps about Ursula's life. Right. I haven't been able to find any information about her between the time she served in the First World War and her admission to this hospital. Do you know anything about that period of her life? To be honest, not really. We just don't know how she did during the years before her nervous breakdown. We think she may have spent that time with her family. Working as a nurse during the worst months of the war took a serious toll on her health and she never really recovered. Oh, I don't even want to think about the terrible things she must have seen. We do know that it was her family that committed her to the hospital. That's how she ended up here. Oh. Don't you think it's weird that they sent her here? Why? Because her family lived in St. Gallen. It would have made more sense to send her somewhere closer to home. Ah, oh, well, who knows? Maybe they thought a change of scenery would be good for her. Mm. Makes sense. Can I help you with anything else? Uh, no, but I'd like to... Do you mind if I take a photograph of this? The notebook? Yes, but not just this page. Do you think I could see the other pages and take photos of them as well? Ah, uh, I think so. But uh, give me a minute. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to touch it. Let me check with the person in charge of the collection. Uh, do you want to wait for me here? Would that be okay? Oh, no problem at all. I'll be right back. Emily leaves, but it doesn't feel like I'm alone in the room. Ursula's eyes follow me as I walk around. The photo on the wall is the same one that Clara had. The only photo of Ursula Bloom that comes up when you search her name online. Ursula looks back at you with her big black eyes. Her gaze is calm. Calming, even. Her hair is pinned up and she's wearing a flowing white blouse with paint stains on it. She's sitting in a chair in front of an easel and you can just about make out a couple of her paintings in the background. She's wearing a medallion that I noticed in one of the cabinets. Ursula looks happy in the photo. I'd say she's about... 30 or 35 years old. So she must have already met Paul Clay by then. Maybe she's met Kandinsky and the other members of the Blue Rider group too. What she doesn't know is that the world is on the brink of war, that she will soon be serving as a nurse during the conflict, and that this room where she is looking straight into my eyes is where she'll spend her final hours. It feels weird. Why did you say it was weird? What did you mean by that? Apart from editing the podcast and playing the music, I've also asked David to help with the research. I need someone to help me make sense of the information I'm uncovering about Ursula Bloom's life. I don't know. I mean, I had no actual expectations about what I was going to find there, but I didn't think I'd be walking into Ursula's room either. Don't you think it's weird for them to have the exhibition right there? Well, one time when I was on holiday, I visited a mental institution where Van Gogh had once stayed. Some random village in France, and there's also an exhibition in his room there. Yeah, yeah, okay. But Van Gogh didn't jump out of the window there, did he? That is true. I guess I can see where you're coming from. I can't help looking out of the window. And how was it? Well, the views of the city and Lake Geneva are stunning. So picturesque. Like something out of a fairy tale. But it's on the fourth floor. It's quite a drop. So... Apart from that, do you think it was worth a visit? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it was. 
I mentioned Ursula's music to them, and they're convinced that she didn't compose it. I still think she did, but... You can't prove it. No, I can't yet. Let's see how it goes with that meal guy tomorrow. Because it's kind of bizarre that there are such conflicting opinions about the music. Plus, I've got photos of her notebook now, too. She let you take photos? Yep. She wasn't able to get in touch with her manager or whatever, so I convinced her that nobody would find out about this. <laughs> I literally begged her to let me see it. You know how I get when I want something. <sighs> that poor woman. <laughs> Indeed. Anyway, check this out. Can you see this photo? Yeah. And can you read what it says down here? Uh, no. No, it's a bit blurry. I can't see the details through the webcam. Okay, so Ursula painted these in the psychiatric hospital. They've got replicas in her room. And the titles are written under each one. Vixie, Dulce Cano, Mortua, and Takui. They're the same words that were written over and over again in Clara's notes. Okay, so what is it about these paintings that caught your attention? I don't know. But they're on show in four Swiss museums, so I want to visit them before I head home. I want to see them in person. Are all four in Lucerne? None of them are here, actually. Two are in Basel, one's in Lugano, and the other one's in Zurich. That's where I'm heading to now. I'm going to start with the one in Zurich. But what's the plan? Are you going to stay there? I won't need to. I'll just do a day trip. Everything's so close here. It'll be like doing a daily commute. A couple of hours after chatting to David, I arrived in Zurich. The first of Ursula Bloom's paintings that I'm going to see is titled Mortua. And it's here, in the Kunsthaus Zurich. The museum is huge, and it's divided into two interconnected buildings. One is very old, and the other is very modern. Designed by David Chipperfield, the museum houses collections that range from medieval paintings to contemporary art installations. They have several works by Ursula Bloom, including the one I'm after, which is on show in a small gallery dedicated to Swiss artists. If you search Ursula online, you'll already know what her paintings look like. But what you don't realize when you see them on a screen or in a book is the sheer size of them. They are massive. Ursula painted Swiss landscapes, and when you're in front of them, they feel like windows into another world. It's a world that looks a lot like ours, but everything is so much bigger and more intense. Her brush strokes blend into each other, and at first glance, you can't really make out what you're looking at. Like when light changes and your pupils take a few seconds to adjust. Mortua means dead in Latin, and the painting depicts a snowy landscape that is split into three planes. There are several birds perched on a cluster of bare branches in the foreground. Then there's a lake that divides the painting in two, and a couple of mountains in the background. I look at it from afar, and when I walk towards it, the painting seems to come to life. When it, when it snows, snows the world whispers. The forest is my temple. Behind the silent wall of frozen water, the earth sings its secrets. This quote by Ursula Bloom reminded me of her snowy landscapes. It's one of the texts from the notebook that I took photos of in Geneva. The original writing is in German, and Amanda helped me translate it this time. Now I'm in the KKL Auditorium, the concert hall in Lucerne. I'm meeting Amanda here, and I feel like I've taken a time capsule to the future. I've been friends with Amanda since I was six years old. She's a member of the Lucerne Festival Orchestra and moved to the city a year ago. She knew David because they played in the same band in London for a while. She's the one who introduced me to him. Amanda's helped me translate the text, and she's also asked me to show her the score that Clara had in her room. I don't think this is a song. What do you mean? I mean, the first part is, right? But then, look. See how the staffs are split in two? Yeah. Okay, so the top part indicates the notes you play with your right hand, and the bottom ones are for your left hand. And this is what the bottom part sounds like. That's it. That's the melody. I play this part, and then it's the same notes again. What changes are the notes on the other part of the staff. That's how the first fragment starts. Okay, now I'm gonna play the beginning of the second one.
So? Uh, didn't you just play the same thing twice? Almost, but not exactly. Listen closely. This part has those notes. But if you pay attention, the following segment has many of the same notes. But these ones, these change. What about the rest of the score? Variations of this same composition. That's why I don't think this is a song. It looks like someone made them as notations or something. Okay, what would you need those notations for? To compose a song? I guess so. But I've never seen anyone take this route to compose anything. It's almost as if she's trying to figure out a song by ear or discarding combinations, maybe? I don't know. Do you have any other scores? No. I found these pages amongst Clara's stuff. They were sent to her by a man who I'm going to interview tomorrow in Basel. I spoke to him on the train on my way to Geneva. His name is Milo... Uh, Sieg Siegenthaler? Uh, Siegenthaler? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Do you think he might have the originals? Possibly. The thing is, this looks like a photocopy of a photocopy and it's hard to read. While you're at it, ask him about these notations here. Do you see them? Didn't David mention them to you? Um, uh, nope. Oh, how very attentive of him. <laughs> you know that everything I'm recording here ends up on David's computer, right? <laughs> you can always count on David. <laughs> well, these notations on the staff, I mean, they could be anything really, but they caught my eye because they look a lot like medieval gnomes. Say what? <laughs> okay, um, so in the Middle Ages, monks sung hymns by heart, right? They wrote the lyrics, but they didn't have sheet music. How come? It hadn't been invented yet. So they used these notations called neumes to get the right pitch. In fact, I think neum means breath. Later on, the neumes evolved into modern musical notation. I don't get it. If there's already a staff on the score, what is this for? No idea. Maybe this melody was meant to be sung? Maybe they wear lyrics? I don't know, I'm just saying things off the top of my head. I wouldn't even have thought about Nooms if I hadn't been to St. Gallen recently. Wait, what's up with St. Gallen? Ursula Bloom was born there. No way, was she? Yeah. Wow. Well, the oldest document with pneumatic notations is actually in the St. Gallen Abbey. In fact, there's an exhibition there where I read that. Even when staff notation was invented, the monks in St. Gallen carried on using nooms. And now you're saying that's where Ursula Bloom was born. Yeah. Well, I don't know. But it sure doesn't sound like a coincidence to me.